records Smell the cover, read all the verses Tell me about your favorites on vinyl and vision Hello and thank you for tuning in to Vinyl and Vision. Uh, this is the video edition of uh, the show where I speak with Weasel Walter this evening for episode 45. Weasel's a, a, an incredibly talented and amazing uh, musician, producer, um, I want to say record mogul, but it's not a mogul, but he, uh, you know, he, he runs his own record label as well. And uh, overall, like, um, you know, music enthusiast and uh, an avid music collector. So um, he's a super great guy to talk to on this show because he has a lot of lot to say about music and influences of music on him and uh, and so forth. So uh, let's get right into it. Um, so uh, you know we can't use the music here on YouTube, so it is what it is. Uh, it's just the conversation, and it's chopped down quite a bit. So if you want to hear the whole conversation, by all means, check out our audio stream uh, wherever it is that you get your your podcasts, you know, um, and you can hear everything, the whole conversation in its entirety. Uh, this is more of like a highlight reel, you know, this is just for, for the short attention span. So please do all the things that you do with the internet and uh, like, share, and subscribe, and uh, all those things, and comment if you will, because it's YouTube, and there's a lot of comments that happen on YouTube, aren't there? If you're watching the video, you're seeing uh, a little bit of a video montage I've created, just uh, splicing some footage together from uh, live clips of uh, Weasel playing in uh, any numerous projects that he's been part of. Just a, a very few few of the, the many. Um, everything from Lydia Lunch's Retrovirus, XBXRX, um, The Flying Lutenbachers, uh, Lake of Dracula, and many others. Never cares. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Oh, yeah, man. I'm okay. In theory. <laughs> oh, really? Is there is there something going on? Is there... Oh, well, I'm really sick of this epidemic. I would like to go back on tour. Oh, right. Well, that yeah. That but I'm out. not. I'm not like you know. I guess I'm not really original in the sense that there's things I'd rather be doing than sitting around waiting for the epidemic to end. But you know, that's how it goes, right? right? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, it's, a, it's a it's a first for us all. I mean, none of us know how to deal with this exactly. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a drag uh, for everybody. I know. It's whatever. So. Mm. Yeah, tell me about it. I mean, I you know I was looking over your website, kind of looking over the uh, the discography, and it's uh, and it is extensive for sure. Yeah, well, I've been busy. This is music is basically what I've done for the last thirty odd years. So um, people sometimes say to me, "Geez, Wheeze, how did you do so much stuff?" I was like, "This is all I do." <laughs> right. Yeah. It's not a hobby, you know. I don't do it when it's convenient. I do it sort of all the time. Yeah. I don't know. I, I've always had the muse and I just figured while the getting's good, I should just seize the day and do what I do and do as much of it as possible. Yeah. So with you having uh, mentioned, you know, the pandemic and it driving you crazy, what are you doing to fill this time considering you're not touring? Lately, I've been a little lacking in motivation, which I need to mm, <laughs> turn around. Um, in the last month, I prepared four masters artwork and audio for four releases, one of which is the new Flying Lutenbachers album that will be out by July. It's called Negative Infinity. Mm -hmm. I personally think it might be the best Flying Lutenbachers album. People can argue with me about that and have their own opinion, but in, in terms of uh, my own goals, I think it's the best album the band's ever made. Yeah, And I don't necessarily tend to think each album is the best one I've ever made. So mm -hmm. there's that... Um, there's a reissue of an old Lutenbacher's album called Cataclysm from 2006, and that is now a double vinyl LP with a live DVD of the band playing a complete concert with multi-cam video and multi-track audio. So that's I've been sitting on that for more than 15 years, and that thing is finally getting released. Um, wow. And then a couple of free jazz things on my label. So I, uh, you know, it's. You know, this summer, by the summer, I'll have four new releases that I'm really proud of. And that was kind of like what I did this month. I don't know. 
just this month. We've been in the pandemic for the whole past year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the past year was pretty interesting. I was in quarantine for about three months in Chicago with family, and I wound up writing the new album. Oh. When I got back in June or whatever, I started whipping my band into shape, and we did rehearsals for... Oh, I don't know. We rehearsed until no, until December and basically recorded that album, knocked that out. That was a lot of work because the new album's very through composed, uh, whereas the last two were very improvised. So hmm. this is a lot more. The new Ludenbarger's album is more of what I would call a brutal prog album. Um, and I'm really happy with it. So it was a lot of work. You know, it was a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> begging my musicians to learn their parts and stuff yeah. like that. But they did, and they played well. We always do these records pretty much live in the studio, so people have to know what they're doing, and everybody played great, so I'm very psyched about it. So, well, let's get right into it, because um, I was very I was very interested in talking with you. I know that, you know, I think everyone that will be listening to this probably already knows very much about at least something of you, probably a number of projects that you have been part of, because there have been so many. Um, it seems that you got in, you got into music early. I guess I did. I was really into comic books and drawing when I was a kid. I, I aspired to be a sort of Jack Kirby type comic book artist. But mm -hmm. when I got bit by the music bug, I would say nine, ten years old, I really started getting more and more interested in music. I did drawing on the side, and eventually, by the, my teen years music had eclipsed everything and I was dead set on becoming a musician. So yeah, I would say it was early, but I would also say that I wasn't, I'm mostly self-taught. I would not consider myself a prodigy in the slightest. Yeah. In fact, my skills were extremely crude when I was young because I didn't have a lot of instruction and people who heard my early music thought I was about as talentless as it came and that I would never <laughs> accomplish anything. So I'm sort of a result of sheer force of will and trying to learn and get better. And, you know, I'm, I'm a bit self-made in a lot of regards. Okay. Well, uh, so with that being said, when was the first, like, how old were you when you started your first band and when was your first recording? I started messing around playing bass which was kind of my first instrument okay uh and i did have a few years of lessons so i could understand the basics of music theory and i started i think when maybe i was oh geez 11 12 i was screwing around with friends in basements just kind of having no clue how to write a composition or a song and trying to play like little riffs I knew or made up or parts that were in pieces of music that I had to learn for my lessons. It didn't really amount to anything. I didn't know how to write a song. You know, I, I think that hearing punk and making the connection about bar chords and root movements in music gave me the keys to writing my first songs hmm. but i would say my real my first real real band that ever did anything was the flying lutenbachers which was formed in late 91 that was the first band i was ever in that had its sh shit together and released a real recording so right yeah so what kind of music were you listening to uh at that young age when i was 15 or 14 i guess when that happened i was really into like british punk especially the damned was a big thing for me i liked their attitude and their chaos and the songwriting and the musicianship and stuff like that punk was a you know punk in general was a pretty big influence on me not so much hardcore but it was sort of more rock and roll type punk music mm -hmm. i thought hardcore at the time was a bit bland and anonymous i didn't really i had to go back later and sort of dig through the oeuvre to find the stuff that was actually interesting yeah. but i was more i was more into sort of like song writing ish punk rock but mm -hmm. i 
wanted to hear weirder music. So I was into stuff like the residents and the no wave bands. And by the time I was 16, I was a hardcore free jazz head. So hmm. I grew up on classic rock radio. So there's something about good songwriting that appeals to my core beliefs, yeah. but also obviously I've done a lot of abstract music and I've listened to, and I'm heavily influenced by a lot of abstract music. So I have this kind of duality of being sort of a classic rock guy and an avant-gardist, I guess, at the same time. It's kind of a yeah. weird paradox, but, hmm. you know, like when I was a kid, I was listening to Foreigner and Kiss on the radio, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and that has its appeal for sure. <laughs> sure, yeah. Okay, so um, let me go back a little further. So what was like, what was music like growing up in the house? Like, were you exposed to stuff by your parents or any, uh, you know, uh, siblings? They had a record player and they had a few records because they had joined the Columbia Record Club at one point. Oh, nice. And how that worked was you could, they would, every month the Columbia Record Club would send you an order form and say, this is the record of the month. And if you didn't send the order form back, they would send you the record and bill you for it. So I think most of the records my parents had, they didn't even want. They sort of messed up and yeah. didn't send the voucher back. Right. So there, it was a pretty weird array of records and there weren't any that I was particularly crazy about. Um, but, you know, the first thing I was really into probably was Kiss. I think my first record was a Kiss record when I was very young. God. Um, yeah. Did you buy it or did somebody else in the house have it? I got it for my birthday. I asked for it. I must have been... Oh, God, it must have been like 1978 or something like that. I mean, it was really young. And my parents, it was called Hotter Than Hell. And my parents took one look at that record and were just like, what the, what is this? Yeah. They had heard of Kiss, but it was a rather lascivious album cover with naked babes on it. And it had the word H-E double hockey stick on it. So I think my parents were a little right. kind of like, huh? But it only got worse from there. So, right. you know. <laughs> Yeah, I can <laughs> the, the minute the minute rock and roll entered the house, the profane uh, obscenity began and only ramped up more and more as time went. So, right. I mean, I had a few records when I was a real kitty, you know, like Kiss records. I had a few Split Ends records and uh, stuff like that, some singles. Mm. But I turned into a pretty hardcore record collector by the time I was. 13, 14 years old. And I was buying a lot of cutouts. I was buying a lot of weird records out of the budget bin for yeah. a dollar and a lot of used records because I was reading a lot of books about stuff, especially weird bands and punk bands. And I would just go through read. And I was just very, I wouldn't say I was OCD, but I was very, um, I was like a sponge and, and I would just suck up all the information about the personnel and the records and stuff. I would just seek the stuff out and it became an obsession of mine. So hmm. my parents aren't particularly musical. In fact, I would say they're not. Yeah. But they appreciate music for what it's worth, but they're not fans. They're not, they don't really pursue music. They're like a lot of people where music is just part of the paradigm. It's, it's around, you hear yeah. it, you know, like, right. I mean, so how do they feel about it now? I mean, what, are, what is it? What do they look back at this? Uh, how do they look back at this now? I think uh, um, I think they respect me. I think they realize that I did what I set out to do with my life and mm -hmm. I did it all the way. And I think they respect that I was serious about what I was doing and they see that I've made some kind of impact and that I have a body of work and that I've accomplished a lot of things. Uh, I didn't pick an easy path in life, clearly, so... I'm sure that concerns them a lot <laughs> concerns <Right. laughs> me. <laughs> so, you know, like there's that factor, but um, you know, my parents are good people. They're real working class people. They're not already, they're not avant-garde in the slightest. I was definitely the freak of the family. I'll put it mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I completely understand that. And I can see that. I mean, I'm not saying that judgmentally. I'm just saying that I can understand what that must be like. I would say I'm weirder than they want to know about. <laughs> yeah. <Right. laughs> I'd say they're they're they haven't I don't think they try to dig real hard. You are um, weirder than they more. ever hoped for. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, what can I say, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. Hey, it, it's working out for you. I mean, to some degree, you know. 
you know, I have morals and I, uh, you know, I have ethics and stuff like that. So I think they, they, they realize that and they mm-hmm. sort of the rest of the cultural stuff, they're just kind of like, eh, yeah, you know, he's into this, whatever. It's like, we don't really know what he does. You know, we just kind of let him do what he does. So it's... Oh, they don't, they don't want to know all the gory details. So I don't blame them. Yeah. Hey, did you just say that you were a parent now? I happen to have a, an eight year old daughter. Yes, I do. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, well, she will avenge me. <laughs> <laughs> She's a real whippersnapper. She is her father's daughter in really? many, many ways. Uh, oh, she's okay. pretty extreme. She definitely got a lot of things from her dad vis-a-vis the genes. So we'll we'll see what oh, she geez. does to the, the world. <laughs> yeah, I bet, right? That's kind of exciting. Exciting and frightening. Uh, yeah, you know the process is somewhat painful, but that's how it goes. It's like yeah, you know, life, right? Right. Yeah. No, it's a motherfucker. I actually have a couple more questions for you before we get into the album that you chose. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, I'd really love to understand or know uh, about your relationship with vinyl records and uh, and uh, how important it is to you to press records as an artist. My relationship to records is that I grew up listening to them mainly because they were the cheapest format to get them. Yeah. At the time, because cassettes, when they came out, I think they were, they cost more than LPs for some reason. Yeah. And, you know, there was a, a fetishistic aspect, obviously to having a pile of records. I mean, duh, that's what record collecting is all about. Uh, as time went on, when, when compact discs came out, they were more expensive than records also. And I was just like, yeah, who needs this crap? You know, records are fine. Hmm. But then once the tables turned, I, in some ways, as far as fidelity goes, I'd rather have compact discs or digital music. I don't, uh, this whole concept that vinyl is somehow superior is a very incorrect blanket statement. Some Hmm. records do sound better than digital and some digital sounds better than records. It kind of depends on the production and the quality involved. Uh, It isn't, there's no truisms there. So Hmm. uh, I have, you know, I still have a record collection because I bought a ton of records and I maybe have half of what I ever had because I've sold a lot of records so I I could eat and pay my rent, but there's sort of, there's some sentimental value to having LPs. So I I still have them and I I listen to them. In fact, I'm in a project where I'm listening to all my rock records in, in um, alphabetical order by artist right now. And I'm in the R's I'm listening to the residents right now. So I I'm literally like cycling through my record collection one by one, just to make sure I'm hitting all the bases. Um, As far as making records, it's all fine and dandy. There's some demand for them. Uh, Some of my music, frankly, isn't popular enough to warrant being on vinyl because, you know, a lot of my avant-garde stuff has a pretty limited audience and I, am a poor person so i can't really lose money making music (laughs) i have to i have to like make a profit or break even which is funny because as you know my music's not commercial at all but there is enough of a fan base you know that i can get by and that's cool so as far as something like the flying lutenbachers there is a demand for vinyl and it's strong enough to warrant pressing the records so I'm happy to make them, but in a way I see the digital version as the definitive version. As far as the audio goes records to me, eh, you know, when I put them next to digital masters, I often like the digital masters a lot more to be frank. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's more of a collector's thing, the the vinyl records and, and you don't really care to be a collector at this point. Not really. I would say per year I buy maybe six LPs total. Um, I'm not flush with money, so I don't, I don't just buy things impulsively, you know, but I like to support artists that I like. So if I like some music, I'm happy to throw money at it because it's part of the, it's being part of a cycle of supporting music and stuff like that. So, you know, paying it forward a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm a music fan first and foremost, and I like to give back to the artists. I know what's involved in being an artist, so I get it. I have 
some empathy. I don't think music is free. You know, I don't think it comes without a price. Uh, Right. You know, but I'm not, I'm not like some extreme moralist about it, but you know, I, I like to put my money where my mouth is sometimes. Respectable. That's cool. All right. So I, uh, now there's a very serious question I have to ask you based on the album that you chose for this evening. Yes. So you chose Mayhem's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, De Mysteries Dom Satanas? Something like that, yeah. Something like that. De Mysterious Dom Satanas, yeah. I just say it like an American. De Mysterious Dom Satanas. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds good. (laughs) We'll go with that. Um, So I understand you're a complicated individual with many influences. So how seriously do you take this album? Musically, I take it very seriously. Uh, when I found this record, it was not long after it came out. I think I bought this record. I bought a CD of it in 1994 or 95. 94 uh, is when it came out. Think about that. And at the time I was, I had discovered death metal through a friend Mm-hmm in 1993 and the stuff really blew my mind. I related to it so strongly. I always was sort of more on the punk side of the tracks, if you know what I mean. Like I thought heavy metal was a bit ludicrous and Mm -hmm. I grew up around stoner culture and I just thought it kind of sucked. So I always had an aversion to heavy metal because I thought it was all guys going, what? But when my friend Kevin drum played me death metal, I was blown away at what alien noise it was. Uh, I started hearing and reading about so-called black metal probably by 1994. And there were a lot of zines and stuff. And that music was a little controversial because it seemed to be pushing some of the aspects of Satanism a lot further than death metal. And it was in some ways, a different stripe of music. It tended not to be as technical as death metal, and it owed more to sort of these dark thrash bands from the 80s and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I had been reading about these bands, and I had been buying stuff, but I had read about Mayhem, and I had read about all this controversy surrounding the band, and it seemed interesting to me for what it's worth. Uh... I remember walking into a CD store in 1994, I think either that or early 1995. And there was a copy of the mayhem album, which which was fairly recently released. So I put on the headphones and I listened to it. And immediately uh, that opening riff from funeral fog just punched me in the face. It was melodic and angular. And I liked the constant blast beat drumming. I thought the singing was very unusual. I liked the clarity. I liked the, the ambience of the whole thing, which seemed to be massive and gigantic. Mm. So I bought the CD. I still have it. And, uh, you know, I incorporated it into my listening as I listened to it more and more. I really absorbed those songs and those song structures. And part of the thing that I love about music is structure. When I hear music, a lot of times I'm really focused on what's happening structurally. I think a lot of people listen to music for like pure sound or the emotions it gives them or, Mm. you know, the events that happen in it that make them feel a certain way. And I do that too, but I'm really into structure in terms of literal structure, like this goes eight times, this goes six, this is a bar of uh, seven, four time, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm a composer and and I think that way all the time. So I really started learning these songs because I think they're very catchy and they have a, a kind of dissonance and angularity in terms of the chord progressions that I like, that I relate to really strongly. Cause I always liked, dissonance and noise and a lot of tension in music. So I just found the music of this album to be extremely dramatic and powerful and relentless and unusual and iconoclastic. And as time went on, you know, I mean, it's 
been more than 25 years at this point. I've been listening to this album. It just, I'm so familiar with it and I love every aspect of it so much. I am still listening to it. You know, I've probably paid for it a few times. I did eventually buy an LP of it when there was a reissue that I found suitable, suitably priced. Um, you know, I still listen to that thing pretty frequently and it makes me feel good and it makes me happy and it makes me, it reminds me of the power of music and why I play it and why I listen to it. And it's, it fulfills my rock and roll roots and it also kind of touches my avant-garde side. Hmm. Okay. And I don't know, where do you want to go with this? <laughs> well, I, was just, I was just curious. Cause I mean, like, so I, I am not a, a metal fan really at all. I mean, like I've listened mm-hmm. to some metal over my, over the course of my life. Um, but I've never really been yep. drawn to it. So, yep. uh, and now you even gave me the yeah. opportunity to, to, to back out of this one, which I said, no, I, I appreciate. Yes, I, respect, I did. Yeah, I respect your your knee jerk reaction to have shot this one out first. And I was just like, okay, there's that means something. I think that that you know really tells something about the 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 strength of the influence it had on you. So I mean, so for me personally, I I, I never I don't I don't understand it. I don't understand uh, black metal music. I, re- I like you know the musicality of it. I understand. And so, you know, you said that you said much you know, something similar to the same. And uh, I, yeah. I agree. I agree with you completely. I mean, listening, like s- deeply listening to the music without considering the context of the vocals or even the sure. image of the band. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's some interesting stuff going on there for sure. Um, but then you, when you, co- when you, you know, sheet that with all of the other things, the, the context of the, 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 you know, the, uh, costuming of the band the the death like you know morbid uh face painting the uh even the attitude that these people have to obviously you know seemingly like honestly believe in satan you know they they want to wreak havoc they want to cause just uh chaos and they promote evil you know and like i i don't relate to that <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah well i have to say that is the least interesting part of it to me at this point. Um, yeah. The controversy around the band Mayhem, particularly around the time when this album was made, which resulted in the burning of churches and the murder of the guitar player by the bass player, uh, which was no laughing matter, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Um, that is part of the myth of the album. I have to say when I listen to it, I'm not concerned with those aspects of it. And I really take it on a musical level. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm not a kid. So that kind of like edgy stuff doesn't really, does really do it for me, right. uh, especially at this point. So there is that whole thing. I do want to say one thing about the vocals because you brought up the vocals. Right. Now, people who don't like or get death metal and black metal is a kind of death metal not vice versa. Like I would consider black metal to be a sub genre of the big thing called death metal. And um, part of the point of why the vocals in death metal sound that way is to repulse people who don't relate to it or get it. It's basically to draw a line in the sand saying we're so ridiculous. Like if you can't handle these vocals, then you're not, welcome to the club it is a little kind of elitist in a weird way i do feel like the vocals are there because with a lot of people i know who don't like metal they always say the same thing lydia lunch said this Uh yeah the music sounds pretty cool but those vocals i can't take them like i can't hear them and that is exactly the point why those vocals are that way (laughs) in the case of this album you know the the guy attila that did vocals on the album. He wasn't actually in the band at the time. He was in, he was Hungarian and he was in a band called Tormentor that had a a demo called Anno Domini. That was sort of a seminal death metal demo. And he was brought in because the guitar player, Euronymous had a lot of connections to the underground scene. And he was trying to cherry pick 
a lot of aspects about what Mayhem did so that he could be the sort of elite figure in the underground scene. So Attila was an unusual choice of a singer for this album. And you've heard it and his, his vocals are very bizarre. There's sort of a, almost a rhythmic at time. And he goes into this operatic timbre that is really a mockery of Catholic priests yeah. um, chanting, you know, and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's almost ludicrous. You know, I think the, the, the vocal performance on Day Mysterious Dom Satanis is very outré. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. you might almost laugh when you hear it the first time because you're like, what the hell is this guy doing? I think I did. I think <laughs> that that kind of shock and surprise is cool in, in a way. Yeah. It's probably an acquired taste mm-hmm. because it almost seems maybe, I'm sure to some people it seems like a joke, you know, like how, why is this, this is like ridiculous? Like, why is this guy doing this? Right. I'm okay with that. You know, uh, I have my own reasons for liking music that may not match up with anyone else's reasons. And that's just how it goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't imagine any other singer singing on that album. Uh, right. To me, it is the music is so tightly regimented and non like everything fits on a grid in that album. Like everything is very tight and it, it fits in in a certain way. And what I like about Attila's vocals on the album is it's almost like the free jazz element on top. It's almost like a soloist because it's the one thing that's not locked into the grid. Mm. And I think that contrast of the tightness of the band and the rigidity of the band structurally, and then having this really crazy vocalist on top is it's a perfect combination. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I can appreciate everything that you're saying about it. You know, um, I think that with you having clarified for me, and and I know I read this somewhere, but I wasn't really thinking about it, but uh, that, that, that desire for, for this band and bands like them in the uh, black metal genre to, to kind of, you know, deliberately ostracize people and kind of like thin out the herd by being so over the top, like in the, in, in the dramatics of it, I guess. Yeah. Um, D- you know whether or not you like the content it's extremely well produced and that's not with the black metal genre that's not necessarily that hasn't necessarily been a thing there was a whole lo-fi ethos with black metal coming from certain sides of the genre i have to say by the year 2000 i thought black metal was very old and tired and that a lot of people came in trying to imitate the form and they were doing it in very bad corny ways. So Mm. um, I can't say there's any modern black metal. I care about at all. In fact, I think it sucks. Most of it. I, most of, most of the great black metal records for me were made in the early to mid nineties. And after that, there's not a lot really. I, I frankly, I like death metal overall a lot more than black metal. I don't know the trendiness of black metal when everyone thought it was like really edgy and crazy that didn't appeal to me at all. Like mm. people focusing on all the crime and the murder and stuff like that in Norway. I, I just, the, to me, that's just like childish bullshit. Like I don't really care about it. So yeah, there is yeah. that duality exists, you know, as you've noted, it's part of the myth of the album but like I said before, I don't, when I hear that album, I don't, I'm not sitting around like rubbing my hands together, thinking about murder and churches burning. It's, it's just powerful. It's, it's like a Wagnerian Sturm and Drang, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's dramatic. It's, uh, it's theatrical. Like I said, I don't mind it musically. I just, you know? I find it a little silly. I mean, and like, like you're saying about the theatrics in general, the theatrics are kind of silly as, as, especially as older men now looking back at it. Yeah. yeah. As a child or as like a young adult, when you maybe were first exposed to this, yeah, okay, that's that's kind of gripping. It's kind of like, you know, interesting and, and enthralling to to hear about these mythologies about it, and like hear about the how how crazy satanic they are and like how you know they burn churches down and they, you know, they they care they don't care for life. They they kind of are are acting true to what they sing about type thing, I guess this isn't really a history course of Norwegian black metal or anything, but a lot of the people that were involved in these crimes were they're teenage kids. You know what I mean? So right. it's like 
the thing about it is I heard this record in 1994 and I was a young man. I kind of hated society. I was, you know, I was pretty alienated. I was pretty antisocial. I had a lot of energy. I liked extreme music. I liked saying fuck you to people. And I liked being a cultural elitist, you know? So Mm -hmm. in a weird way, I was at the right place and time for this stuff to click with me. I never burnt down a church. I never killed anybody. And I never even thought about it. Mm-hmm. it. Wasn't anything that I wanted to have anything to do with. I guess in some ways it's like no different than punk rock in the late seventies, where it was sort of a nihilist youth movement that was trying to sort of destroy everything that came before it. I mean, it's only as silly as that, honestly, or Jerry Lee Lewis, like, putting his feet on the piano or, you know, like whatever. I mean, it's, it's all a matter of perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, The thing is when you come down to it and you strip away all of the, the mythos around this mayhem album, you know, for me, it's a perfect rock and roll album. So, you know, I, I, I'm not really that interested in the crime around it. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of beside the point to me at this point. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. let's uh, let's go ahead and get into the album a little bit. Let's. You love Transylvania. It's yeah. such an assault, and it's such a masterful, like structurally, it's so great. They open up with the catchiest riff on the album, and when when the track was recorded, there's actually a, a drum fill that goes before that sounds like. So they they decided at the last minute to cut off this opening drum fill that they always played live. So it almost sounds like when the music starts, it's starting in progress, which mm. I think is a really powerful way to open okay. an album where it seems like it's already just like full steam ahead from the first second. But then it ratchets it ratchets up more, you know, it yeah. just keeps going further and further. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. When the, so it goes through this tight set of sequences at the beginning and then it chokes, you know, stops on a choke. And then this weird guy comes in on vocals. <laughs> it's, it's a bit bizarre, you know, I'll admit yeah. it, you know, when I, I have to say like the first time, you, you know, you, heard this i wouldn't blame you if you're laughing because you're probably just like what the hell is going on you know yeah, but yeah Gollum just walked in the room <laughs> yeah exactly it's kind of hilarious i mean but to me you know that's that's the sign of good art right all right so let me uh let's get into the song a little bit um so from my research uh i found a quote from from the lead singer uh the former lead singer who who you know committed suicide before this album was released uh who went by the name dead so uh, death is obviously a focal point uh, of the majority of the Mayhem catalog lyrically. So Dead wrote, it's so thin and so beautiful, but also so dark and mysterious. Uh, those are some of the words from the song. So what are your thoughts about death? And are you afraid of it? My thoughts about death. I haven't been afraid of death in a long time. I think when I was a kid, like most kids, you get to a point where you have heard and thought about death and it seems very scary because what if you die? You haven't even done anything with your life yet. I think that is a natural position that any really young person would have. I haven't been scared of death in a long time because I tried to live as much as I could, maybe too much sometimes. And I know it's inevitable and I know it's not something I'm necessarily looking forward to, but I don't think you necessarily get to choose when you die, unless you take your own life and you might even fail at that. So it's, um, it's tricky. I'm not going to act like I'm a real tough guy that has no fear of death whatsoever, because that would be a lie. But I do think that really living is more important than dwelling on death. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've had friends die. People in my life have died. Mm -hmm. It's not great when it happens. (laughs) Yeah. I I'm not a death worshiper. I think going back to the whole idea of, of these lyrics as metaphors, there was a situation. There were situations around the band where the metaphor 
became real. Like you talked about their, their early singer De- dead who probably wrote half this album with them, but he killed himself before they even started recording it. Right. Um, mental illness comes into play here. Oh, you yeah. know, I think, and mental illness is a serious thing. And I think a lot of mental illness is not addressed in people. And this is a crisis of civilization, you know, uh, right. Especially in America, a lot of people who are mentally ill, they have not much recourse for therapy or, you know, uh, medical help. So you have a lot of crazy fucking people in America. And apparently in Norway, at that point, you had a lot too. Yeah, I don't think I don't think some of these people were in their right mind. I think they were mentally ill. And I don't I don't uh, salute them for having mental illness and acting on it. Right. Um, Great. Well, that's that's that thing that's good there. I want to move on to the next song. Yeah. Which is uh, Freezing Moon. Please do. I do like that riff. I got to say that doom, 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 and that kind of slide down. Yeah, that kind of sliding guitar business is sort of a distinctive part of the playing on the whole album it's uh mm. it's sleazy or, or something i mean mayhem's a rock and roll band let we lest we not forget you know they're they're <laughs> yeah. they're kind of a classic rock band in a weird way i mean they, yeah. these guys grew up listening to heavy metal they're into motorhead and stuff Black like Sabbath. that yeah yeah exactly you know celtic frost so, was another band yeah well celtic frost yeah you know ultimately <clears throat> mayhem is a rock and roll band you know Obviously, it's very repetitive, the selection you played. Mm-hmm. And I think that the repetition in their music is ritualistic or ceremonial when they use it. Because Freezing Moon has all these series of tempo changes. We didn't even get to the sort of part where it kicks into the main song. Right. I think it's almost like the beginning part is a processional. And then it kicks in. And then the blast beats start again. And I have to say... I love the drums. Uh, the dr- drumming on this album is just perfect to me. Hellhammer, he he got more and more technical as the bands uh, progressed to the point where it's almost ridiculous. But mm. I feel like on this album, it's just such great rock drumming. Everything about it is it's so showy and <laughs> perfect, and you know. My, it's like it's he's like a machine gun on this album there's just something so great about how the drums are recorded they sound yeah. so warm and big you, and so uh, i was looking for a quote um about uh the recording of the drums specifically mm-hmm. because i know that you are a drummer as well and I, and obviously you you like the way that this was recorded so um yeah. i found a piece from a rolling stone article that, the, that was written on them let me see if i can find the right part uh so in the sessions that span 92 through 93, the band consisting of Euronymous, Vic, Vickerns, and Hellhammer converged on Grieg, Grieg Hall. Is that how you pronounce that? Grieg Holland, yeah. Grieg Hall, home to uh, yeah. Bergen, Norway's Philharmonic Orchestra to record. The studio was located a few floors up in the building, but it had a low ceiling, and Hellhammer thought it, it muted his sound. Then he went into the main hall where a five-piece drum kit was set up and loved the sound there. I says, this is a quote, I says to engineer Python, I want my drums down there, says Hellhammer, who recalls being a big jazz fan at the time, inspired by Buddy Rich. And he goes, hi, you're crazy. Yes, I am. And then he understood. We took the cable for the microphones and ran them down the elevator shaft. They set up some candles down there and dimmed the lights. And subsequently, the mysterious Dom Sathanas had one of the most powerful drum sounds in metal. There you go. I would say so. Yeah. No, it's great. Uh, I do like the drums in this on this record. Um, you know, that's definitely something that stood out to me. So, Freezing Moon. You know, I have a question about. I have song. to say before we move on. Sure. There are there are instrumental rough mixes of this album. Just saying. Oh really? I don't think I could afford. Oh yeah, them. they exist. <laughs> yeah, I can hook you up, bro. Oh really? You can put your own. You can do karaoke mayhem karaoke on top. Oh wow, that would be a challenge. <laughs> we can try that. After everything opens I would back do up, that. there's the boombox downtown in Providence. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll do my best Gollum impression that I can. My precious. Excellent. My ring. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get that looking through the lyrics. As a matter of fact, looking through the lyrics for me, uh, it made me wonder if this song was about a werewolf. 
hey, maybe no. maybe more metaphors. Yeah, yeah. Let me see. Where are some some samples of lyrics? Uh, it's night again, night you beautiful. I I please my hunger on living humans. Night of hunger, follow its call. Follow the freezing moon. That's one one verse. It's got a strong Halloween vibe. For the sure. whole album does. <laughs> well, yeah, for sure. I mean, this is definitely a Halloween album. All right. Well, so that's pretty much all I've got for Freezing Moon. Let's move on to uh, Cursed in Eternity. Oh, yeah. That was good. That was a good drum break. <laughs> I feel like making. Uh, yeah, that was a good drum. That was a good drum break. It was. You know, I have to say <laughs> something. I, I wonder with blast beat drumming. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started listening to this music, the beat would kind of flip flop and I would hear the snare as the downbeat, you know, it's cause it's sort of like, it's sort of these alternating between the kick and the snare. And uh -huh. if you're not used to where the one of the beat is, it's almost like it flips over and the syncopation becomes the downbeat. And I think that's a confusing thing maybe for people who aren't used to this music, they don't hear the downbeat and it can be just even more disorienting, or maybe mm. that's even more of like the code of the music yeah. where it's, it's almost like you have to have experience listening to the music to really hear it or something like that, I guess. Yeah. That sounds about right. I mean, I can, I can see what you're talking yeah. about. I mean, I haven't given this enough of a listen uh, to know for sure, or to be able to speak to that really, yeah. but I can see what you mean. I, I went to two shows on the, on the, Day Mysterious Dom Satanis tour. I guess it was a few years ago. Where were these shows happening? Let's see. I saw them in Chicago and New York. <clears throat> oh, okay. And like, what kind of venues were these? They were... The New York one was at St. Vitus, which is a pretty small rock bar. And it was sold out. And I think maybe the capacity must have been... 200 250 or something so people were really crammed in there oh, wow. and i was right in front i don't mess yeah. around i'm like i'm not there to like vibe on the rest of the audience i don't like people so i don't want to be in a room full of people like so i'm trying to like exclude them from my <laughs> from my enjoyment of the music by being like close to the front yeah um and then the other one i saw i guess i saw in chicago and that was i drove uh the bass player uh, necro butcher around that day because he had put out a photo book of old vintage mayhem photos and thurston moore printed that so thurston called me and i guess i was like the go-to guy to drive necro butcher around he said hey wheeze you want to come to chicago and drive around necro butcher and i said yes i absolutely would so uh thurston flew me to chicago i saw my family and then i spent the whole day driving necro butcher around you know laughing it up listening to metal and i went to the concert that night i think it was that was at a bigger venue i think it was at the cabaret metro which is more like 800 a thousand people and it was packed i mean it was a yeah. big show oh, okay i might be wrong about the venue i have my short-term memory stinks like these okay. days because hmm, hard living mm -hmm. but uh I have, I have brain damage from being awesome but uh <laughs> i think it was at the metro i don't know it doesn't really matter but it was in chicago and it was at a bigger yeah. venue and uh okay. the sound was kind of stinky but whatever yeah happened. we're gonna move on to the next song yeah which is pagan fears pagan fears all right first thing i want to mention is that that right there that we were listening to that part do you think that that sounds like uh, Sailing On by Bad Brains? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not crazy. Yeah, uh, sort of. Well, it's the same chord progression. That's for sure. I never yeah. thought about it that way, but it's it's the exact same interval, at least. I don't know if it's in the same key. It could be, actually. Wow. I have a pretty good tonal memory for key centers. Okay. Uh, I have what you would call good relative pitch. I don't have perfect pitch where someone can sing a note and I can just tell you what note it is. Right. But I have certain pitches memorized, like the low open E on a guitar. I have that memorized. I can recognize oh, it. Okay. Uh, well, well, let's try it. You ready? Uh, 
We don't want it anymore. I walk right out the door. Hey, I think it's the same chords. Absolutely. That's funny. I never noticed that. Okay. Just, I think it just it's literally the same chord progression. That's funny. Good call. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. It just jumped out at me. Just like immediately. Like I yeah, heard it. That's like, funny. Well, you know, I think those guys, I'm, yeah, you know, a lot of the chord progressions and the mayhem stuff on this album are very elemental. They're, they're almost things that have been used a million times recontextualized in this powerful way. It's almost like maybe that's why it's so um, it hits me so hard is because a lot of the chord progressions are not, they're things you have kind of heard a million times, maybe mm -hmm. like, I don't know. There's like a familiarity to it that's there the first time you hear it or something. I mean, yeah. it's ingenious. It's like, it's very simple music in a lot of ways. There are complex yeah. things about it, like the drumming and maybe some of the structure. But I think the idea was to make a lot of riff, a lot of the riffs really memorable by making them very simple and have this very specific kind of uh, gravity to them. Yeah. So. Some things are just undeniable. Like you sometimes using the simplest thing does make sense, but then it's what you do around it that makes it not just another, you know, punk chord progression you've heard a million times. And I think that's the key to music in general. Mm. Okay. A mix of the familiar with uh, new con contexts or whatever. So uh, based on the song and yeah. the, some of this information that I've shared with you, um, what do you hope will be the long-term significance of your body of work? Mine? Oh, um, I'm not counting on it. <laughs> and I think at one point, I think I desired that my music and art would make some kind of concrete impact. And now I know that there's a lot of art and it affects those who like it or appreciate it or who come in contact with it and are affected by it. Mm -hmm. The artist doesn't necessarily know how anyone is affected by their art. Um, sometimes they show up and they clap for it. Other times you, you have no clue who's experiencing your art and what they think about it and how it impacts you. So I let go of that a long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, necessarily get that much feedback from my art a lot of the time and uh if i did it for that feedback i would have probably quit a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> right well a lot I, of times i, I make stuff and I, yeah hmm. a lot of times i just make stuff i put it out there and kind of shrug my shoulders and move on to the next thing you know right well i mean i was yeah. i've only asked the question based on like how much of a discography I know that you already have. I mean, it's, it's pretty, yeah. pretty astounding really for, for a person that, of your age to have that much work behind them is, is staggering really. So, um, well, thanks. Yeah, no, I mean like, and, and I, I know see that, it. go ahead. Oh, I, I know that like, I've heard you speak about it and, um, I know that you are very kind of like, um, unapologetic about what you create and how you create it. And, um, yeah. you know, you don't really care what people think about it you're, you're just making what you want to make and you you're making it the best that you can there must be some desire for it to kind of um leave like a legacy of some sort i mean i try to avoid that word at this point but yeah i think you know what i mean i do well i think you've touched on some pretty relevant points ultimately i did it because um uh, you know, I, ha I have, I always thought there was right and wrong ways to do art and music. And it's so subjective. Uh, I always felt like if you don't like everyone else's music, you should make your own and make it exactly how you think it should be made. And that's all I really did. Hmm. Obviously, I love music. I have a lot of influences. And in some ways, I'm a bit eclectic. But all I did was just synthesize all my influences and everything I like and try to do my own version of it and be part of the continuum. So if I'm part of that, great. You know, like some people like my stuff. That's that's cool. Um, that doesn't make me complacent. You know, I oh, feel yeah. like it's a gift to be able to do this in a weird way. Not everyone can do this. So I try to 
take advantage of that and really um, do the best I can with what resources I have and try to keep the bar really high mm. because I think it's a privilege that anyone would pay attention to my music because there's so much of it, right. you know, like I'm glad if someone thinks there's something about my music that makes it stand out enough that they want to check it out. You know, I don't want to disappoint most people. And I know that the only way not to disappoint them is to keep my own uh, cr criticism of my music and my standards as high as it's always been. So, you know, mm. that's, that's my mission. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know? so if people want to check out your music, uh, considering you have so much of it and I am, I am, you know, honestly a novice to it as well. I mean, I've listened to some of the flying Lugenbacher records. I listened yep. to some of the, uh, XBRX, uh, XBXRX. XBXRX. Yeah. XBX or X. Yep. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Um, oh, yes. And sure then, of is. course, obviously, some of the retrovirus with Lydia Lunch. Um, yeah. Where, where would you say is the good, is the best place to, to start? Um, I am interested in jazz. Yeah. What, uh, what good, like, what kind of uh, jazz should I get, get into that you've put out? Well, I mean, most of my stuff is definitely in the realm of so called free jazz or a free yeah. improvisation. That's so, I mean, yeah, most of my stuff is definitely on the experimental side and it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty uncompromising stuff, but I've been fortunate enough to play with a lot of heavy people, um, kind of legends, I would dare say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like, um, a great record to start with if you're into crazy, heavy, free acoustic, free jazz with saxophones and drums and going nuts, uh, I made a record in 2007 called Firestorm, and it features Marshall Allen, the alto player from the Sun Ra Orchestra. And it's uh, okay. It is a uh, earful. You know. <laughs> okay. No, that sounds a wall weird. of sound. Firestorm. Sure. I will look into that then. Excellent. I will run down to my local record store and see if they have it. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guarantee it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Weasel, I'd just like to say uh, this was a very cool conversation, and I thank you for, for taking the time and having it with me. Hope it wasn't too terrifying. I got used to it. <laughs> I acclimated. Good. Yeah. Good. Glad to hear it. All right, I, might, I might even listen to some other Mayhem records at this point. But Oh, uh, my God. Well, let me recommend... What's that other one you were talking about? The free jazz? It's called free... Ordo Ad K.O., like chaos right. without the S. Okay. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. I, you might find it interesting. I think that's their other really great record, honestly. So I, I recommend that one, but it's, it's more avant-garde for sure. You know? mm -hmm. That's okay. I, I'm willing yeah. to try it. Cool. I'm an experimenter. I'm, I'm okay with, with trying new things. I'd love to know what you think of it. Okay. Cool. I'll let you know. I'll send you a message. Yeah, if you like if you like my rock and roll side, check out the second Cellular Chaos record, Diamond Clenched Teeth. That is, I'm very proud of that record. Hmm. Okay. I cool. would dare say it's somewhat accessible, but not really. <laughs> okay. I'm, cool. I'm willing. Willing for All right. sure. Great. Cool, man. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. You have a good evening. Until next time. All right. <laughs>